Kevin, where's Kevin? Can you give me a 10 minute wave? Thanks. I got a lot of material. Um, hopefully, yeah. What I want to do is uh, provide a survivor's guide, um, kind of a macro view. Um, and um, I spent a lot of time looking at the golf industry. Uh, and I think I spent a lot of time behind the scenes working with facilities to help them negotiate uh, a difficult market. We like to think, I like to think of golf as a great game, but a lousy business. So uh, my job is to help you make it a little less lousy. Um, and uh, it helps that we're at great clubs like Alpine here. And uh, Jay left out the most important part, which is I used to caddy on the tour. Uh, that's me on the left. By the way, <laughs> um, I caddied from, I was Bernhard Langer's first caddy in the U.S. in 1981-82, and uh, it was great. I loved it. It was the greatest job in the world, and uh, really great. I learned a lot. I learned a lot about players and people. And my experience is, I, I have this sort of saying that once you grow up as a caddy, you never lose that feeling. I think we've lost a lot about the game because we've lost some of the entry level into the industry, and uh, I still try to keep my credentials by caddying occasionally at honorary events and openings and so on. But I'd like to say that uh, there are lots of lessons from the caddy yards. Uh, I think there's great recruitment into the game. Uh, you learn the value of hard work. There's nothing like trying to show up sober at 6 a.m. in the morning, which is, uh, as most superintendents know, is very hard for, to get your crew, much less yourself, to do. So uh, I think you learn how to read people's character, which is really cool. Uh, you learn very fast people's predilections and habits and so on. I like to think that uh, this doesn't come out as well as it's kind of blurred, but uh, one of the lessons I learned as a working class kid pedaling my bicycle over the Woodmere Club in Inwood is that rich people can be really, really stupid too, just like everybody else. So I learned not to fear anybody. And as a result of that, I developed uh, one of my journalistic skills. I have a portable. Uh, patented GPS battery-operated bullshit detector. Uh, comes to be very handy when you're dealing with rich, powerful people who are not used to listening and uh, who um, like to do things who think that money speaks. So you sort of learn to discern and to sift through a lot of the industry. The other thing I learned about uh, caddying and about the game is that there's a lot of hard work that goes into it. And most of it is unappreciated. So when I go cover events, I like to hang out in the maintenance yards. I like to get up really early and uh, see what they're doing, whether it's at Marion or Matt Schaefer behind the scenes when they're mopping up after a torrential rainstorm. Or uh, over at Sabonic, I was there. I wrote a book about the Women's Open in 2013. So I got up really early every morning to watch nighttime maintenance. I'd never seen that before, or early morning maintenance. You had to get the boat tees ready for 6.45 a.m. And Garrett uh, did a great job there. Uh, Grant Garrett body and the superintendent and the crew and uh, Mike Pescucci and Sabonic and uh, got up really early and watched this. It was really cool. It was an amazing experience. And I, you know, one of the things about superintendents is the better your job, the less people notice you. And that's probably a good thing. It's kind of like refs in major sports. So uh, it's unfortunate you never appreciate it until they think you suddenly went stupid and then they try to fire you because you know your course rating went down by two points. But uh, they don't really understand, I think, the labor and the job that green chairmen have. I'll talk about this a little bit. Uh, to show respect and restraint and to spend time learning the trade by going to shows and going to regional meetings and the national meeting, I think it's really important because the job of the green chairman, I used to think, when I was caddying, I thought the green chairman's job was to who hooked the ball was to take out the left side bunkers. And the next guy who sliced the ball put trees down the right side so he wouldn't go out of bounds. That was my understanding and my experience of the initial green chairman. Now their job is to facilitate the professionalism and the science of the superintendent that they represent and to uh, provide input to the board about budgets and to protect the superintendent, not to go after them. So I think the more you appreciate uh, what goes on on that other side, one of the things I like to think about is that if you have green committees, you should meet in the maintenance building. You shouldn't meet in the clubhouse. <coughs> you should find out, spend time, meet the crew, go out there in the morning, ride with them, maybe not see what they do. And of all the photographs, I've taken a lot over the years. Um, these, to me, really show the labor that goes into getting a golf course set up, the rolling, the mowing, the effort, 
uh, so that when the tee shots go off on both tees at 6.45 in the morning, the players have the best possible conditions. Golf is a really weird business. Um, I studied political economy, I wrote about it for years, taught it, and uh, I can't think of a more upside down industry. Uh, it's based on things that they're not producing anymore, like land. So it's land extensive, totally irrational these days. It's labor intensive, and any superintendent can tell you 60 to 70 percent of their budget is labor costs. It's kind of, I think it's akin to family farming, which tells you about how up to date it is in terms of profitability and, and uh, productivity. But it's in terms of that level of early morning, all through the day, dependent on elements, things you can't control for a product that has to be perfect and gone to market. Uh, it also has a strong retail component in terms of the cash register, whether it's a daily fee operation or monthly dues, which is essentially a retail basis on a monthly uh, calendar. It's very service oriented. We like to think of game as a great uh, golf as a great tradition, but it's really the hospitality industry. And it's a weird upside down model because there's an inverse relationship between the amount of money that the people are being paid and how much time they actually spend with the clients. In other words, the people who are highly paid salaried people wearing suits and doing spreadsheets there in the office, whereas the hourly workers at minimum wage are the greeters, the valets, they're the parking lot, they're the maintenance people, and so they have the highest level of contact. It's a very strange thing that the wealthy people who are playing the game have most contact with the lowest paid folks on staff. So as a model of service industry, it's really strange, very hard to sustain. Um, golf development over the years, this is the United States, a couple of interesting things. First of all, golf is overwhelmingly in the public sector. So uh, of the 16,000 golf courses in the United States, only 4,000 of them are public, uh, or, I'm sorry, are private. Uh, the rest are in the resort, daily fee, uh, municipal, military, university uh, sector. And most of you, I suspect, are in the uh, private club market. What's really interesting is that in uh, 2014, we have the exact same number of private clubs in the United States that we had in 1930. 4,000. Same number. That number hasn't changed. Population has gone up three times. In 1930, the U.S. population was 100 million. Now it's 300 million. So that tells me that the ability of the American public to afford private golf is about three times more difficult, more expensive than it was uh, 85 years ago. So it's no wonder that the industry struggles because it's increasingly difficult for the average American or even wealthy Americans to afford of uh, membership in a club, and I think we should keep that in mind. Golf participation is down. Now, I have to show you the numbers. We can explain some of them. I don't have, in some cases, final numbers for 2014. The National Golf Foundation is kind enough every year to uh, uh, provide me with data in hopes that I won't rip them and criticize them in public. <laughs> it hasn't worked. Um, they kind of know it, so I do it with a smile. But uh, golf participation is um, which peaked at about 2000, 2002 or so, golf participation in the United States, just simply people who count themselves or, or counted as playing golf, whether it's 125 rounds or one, uh, that number is dropping at about 2-3% a year. So the peak was uh, just over 29.5 million. In 2013, the number was about 24.5 million, and there's no reason to expect that number to go up. So there are fewer golfers in the system. Now, there are lots of internal dynamics about frequency, age, and all that, but overall, participation is down. Total number of rounds played is also decreasing. It peaked in 2000 with 518 million rounds in the United States, uh, and uh, it's been steadily declining uh, with one blip for good weather in 2012. Um, uh, the numbers in for last year, 2014, are down to 459 million. So there's a steady erosion of the number of rounds played. Uh, and that's important to know because it means that the consumer base is shrinking. So clubs have to do something to make themselves more appealing in an environment in which the ability to afford that club is more difficult than ever. Utilization. You were running an industry and you were running at 52, 53 percent capacity, you probably wouldn't expand your productive system. But we were doing that for the last 20 years. By utilization, I'm talking about tea sheets, how much tea time was available, how many tea times were sold. So if you take total number of rounds, divide by the sheet, uh, the number of courses, and how much of all available, you can see that the utilization rate is somewhere on the right side at uh, 51%. And you know that because your T-sheet 
When I caddied back in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, tee sheets were full on weekends. On Saturday, tee sheet was mobbed at private clubs from 7 till 3. That's not the case anymore. Saturday afternoons are quiet. Uh, by 11 o'clock, tee sheet's empty. Tuesday afternoons are dead. Uh, Thursday afternoons are pretty quiet as well. Lots of open space, and that's on public courses as well. So there's an issue there to fill that. And some clubs are, and facilities are able to manipulate variable pricing and uh, point of sales uh, spreadsheets to uh, allocate tee times. But that's a real issue for the management of the industry. We're trying to fill space on a golf course that's essentially only half being utilized. Uh, the industry is catching up. They were building courses like crazy. The NGF in the 90s was calling for uh, opening up a new course a year. I really pissed them off in 05 when I said we need to close down the course a year. As, as I was ahead of my time a little bit. Uh, we're closing down a little bit, but certainly course openings are way down. When I was writing uh, back in the mid 90s, there was a course a day opening. It was impossible to keep up with the flood of the new golf courses. The last few years, we've seen 10, 11, 20, 18 courses open a year. This year, we'll probably see about 24, 25 courses. So it's way down. <coughs> Talk to any architect. Uh, Tom Fazzi used to have 25 full-time employees. Now he has three. Uh, the Arnold Palmer Company, which is going to do a course in Scotland, they used to have 26 employees. They have two architects now. So every company is down dramatically. At the same time, there's a lot of renovation work. Uh, a lot of smaller firms, people who used to, uh, who were working for big companies have been spun off and doing small, modest renovation work. A lot of these innovative things I'll talk about. Golf course closures now are a big part of the industry. Basically, it's 155 to 160 courses a year. And uh, you'd think that uh, in a tight market, the closure would help uh, make the industry more competitive because you're reducing supply. Unfortunately, what's happening is that the least competitive, smaller, privately owned, kind of mom and pop courses and the lower level performing private clubs are the ones that are closing right now. So as the, mar as the supply is shrinking a little bit, the game is actually getting more expensive because the marginal facilities can't make it. They're dropping out and converting to uh, other uses of real estate. I always think that this is actually understated, that there are a lot of more financially teetering facilities that would convert or turn over or close, except that the zoning laws, open space provisions, and reluctance of towns to allow them to uh, uh, rezone uh, prevents those courses from converting to uh, commercial real estate. So uh, I think there's a lot more uh, pent up demand, if you will, for closure than we're seeing. And I think it's going to uh, certainly keep up at this rate, if not increase, over the next few years. Total supply of golf courses in the United States has been dropping since 2006. If you take uh, the closures uh, and uh, factor in the openings, it's a net loss over the last few years, which Again, shrinking supply simply indicates there's a lot of pressure on the existing facilities. And total golf course supply in the United States, which peaked in about 2010, has been declining just slightly. There's still uh, just under 15,600 golf courses in the United States. Okay, why are we there? How do we get out of this? I think there was a model that prevailed uh, in the 90s. Uh, essentially, it was sort of build it and they'll come uh, it was modeled after the baseball park in uh, W.P. Kinsella's um, Shoeless Joe book, and the, you know, the, the ball field in Iowa. Which, by the way, that ball field that they made the movie out of, that's for sale. And they couldn't make enough people to go. They were, they're, they're trying to sell it for six and a half million dollars. They can't find a buyer now. So uh, nothing is sacrosanct in the economy. I think there was a notion of build it the, and they'll come. And people looked at places even as obscure as Sand Hills in Nebraska, abandoned dunes, and, in Oregon and thought, well, if they can build it there and violate every rule of real estate, you know, real estate, location, location, no. Golf is going to draw, people are going to go. In fact, Sand Hills and Bandit Dunes are the exceptions. Every other one of those remote golf courses is struggling, whether it's the Prairie Club in northern Nebraska, I've been to all of these, Prairie Club, uh, Valley Neal in Colorado, uh, uh, the one in um, Sutton Bay in South Dakota. A lot of these obscure courses are struggling because, in fact, it's an unusual circumstance to have a facility. Those courses succeeded at Sand Hills and Bandon Dunes because the owners were smart and cheap and didn't spend any money. Sand Hills was built for $10 million total. Uh, the first course at Bandon Dunes was built for $3 million. Kaiser is smart because he doesn't spend a lot of money, doesn't throw it away. Uh, but everybody else thought you could spend 30, 40 million bucks and they'll come. That's not the case. One of the things I saw, I was involved in a municipal golf course project in the town of Bloomfield. I wrote about it in my book. 
and uh, I was uh, coordinating the whole project. We got Pete Dye to design it for a dollar. We ended up spending about ten million on the whole project. But we started doing uh, RFPs for uh, feasibility studies, and I kept looking at all these reports in the mid nineties. Every one of them said yes. And so one of the things we did when we were vetting uh, uh, feasibility people is we said, "Give us a sample that she said no. Give us a sample that actually realistically assessed a market somewhere, might have been the Oklahoma Panhandle, to say no." It was hard to find. People got really nervous because. The market was sort of structured for go, 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 ego, whether it's the mayor or the guy who wants to uh, have the coolest sports club in town, and they were spending ridiculous amounts of money, or real estate developers who didn't care what the golf course cost, because all they were doing was selling real estate front of anyway. So uh, I, I, like to say, I like to say that I never met a feasibility study that said no. And I have a theory about golf markets, kind of like the market across the river, which is that for a certain period of time, everybody was lying about what actual value was. And they were speculating and they were betting on futures rather than actual returns on the, the performance of the facility. There was also a lot of nonsense in the industry, kind of the notion of sex sells, or at least fancy uh, photography and imagery. Uh, Desmond Muirhead's golf courses were kind of a popular for the, or attractive, at least for this um, reason. Uh, all sorts of gimmicks, computer-aided design by guys who were too cheap to have a hard drive that could generate a curved line, so all they did was design like straight lines. <laughs> Doug Smith's uh, colleagues, uh, but this is a Palmetto Hall in Hilton uh, Head, uh, all straight lines. The only thing is guys don't drive golf carts in straight lines, and uh, people who operate mowing equipment in the morning, especially for reasons that I already <laughs> articulated, do not low and straight lines, so these courses break down pretty quickly. There was also a lot of uh, nonsense about what would pay, and it was based on the illusion of an oasis out in the, in the Vegas, uh, in the Nevada desert, about uh, Shadow Creek, that if you could have a city, I guess, that has no water and two million people, it was the fastest growing city in the country for 20 years in a row, for a while anyway, it has a pyramid, an Eiffel Tower, 3,000 Elvis impersonators, you could spend 38 million bucks on a golf course, at Shadow Creek and get away with it. So that was sort of the model. And Tom Fazio himself was very skilled at basically saying the site didn't matter. You could build anything you wanted if you spent enough money. And then you had to maintain it, which was not his problem. The other thing is that the real estate boom, about 60% of the golf courses built over the last 25 years were designed not for golf, but for real estate. It, the development of real estate golf courses has nothing to do with the demand for golf. It has everything to do with the provision of attractive uh, real estate lots on homes uh, for home sites where the value was presumed to stabilize. And uh, the cost here was all oriented towards selling real estate and getting zoning variances for low density. You used the golf course as a uh, stormwater management system. You used it for zoning variance for open space. It had nothing to do with the demand for golf. Uh, and uh, they kind of overdid this as well. We're now paying the price for the glut of the real estate market. The other thing that's really interesting, besides the glut and the kind of irresponsible accounting that was going on, uh, there's a sort of basic, to me, antithetical structure to golf and modern culture. If you would sit and design a game uh, that was at odds with everything that's, that we stand for today, uh, it would it actually it would look like baseball, but it would really be golf. Uh, and uh, because of its land extensivity, extensiveness, uh, the labor intensity, and the, uh, the low return. And so it's not surprising that modern kids are not going into the game. They're not being recruited with caddy yards. All the smart kids are out there elsewhere spending their time with lots of sophisticated computers and games and apps. Um, and uh, that's where the smart people are. They are playing golf, but they're playing it on um, EA Sports. I think Rory McIlroy is on the latest cover. This guy's not playing as well, selling as much lately, but still, that's where a lot of kids are learning their golf, or, uh, and I, I don't know if this is a disaster or just a headache, but Top Golf, if you've ever looked at Top Golf, uh, which some people hope will be an entry level into the game, and to me, I hope it's just a diversion that they never end up on a golf course, because uh, the values here are very strange. Uh, although they're hitting golf balls and they're drinking a lot and having a lot of fun in the party, and all of these top golf facilities are doing really well. Uh, it's more about the gathering, the social event, than it has anything to do with golf. Uh, still, those are people who, who could be tracked toward golf, but they're being diverted or they're doing other things. And I think that's the real issue for the game. 
is that the future golfers are doing lots of other things. They're playing this, they're playing computer games, uh, they're trying to get their careers started, uh, they're not learning the game. The golf market has changed dramatically over the last 30, 40 years. Since a lot of us, and I'm, if I'm dating myself, I can't help that, um, uh, having caddied in the 60s, uh, you know, you sort of grow up and think, realize things have changed. The private club that I knew, that a lot of us grew up in, I think, uh, was thought of as the sort of center of leisure and status consumption. Now it's kind of like an embarrassment or something you do on the side or you sneak in and you get back to your family or you get back to your work life. Uh, the role of corporate entertainment has completely changed. It used to be that the private golf club was a center, lots of activity, lots of um, uh, schmoozing, if you will. Uh, tax laws have changed, corporate priorities, perceptions of how that is carried out, and the nature of the clubs themselves have changed. I think gender roles have changed completely as well, so that uh, the, the, the private golf club as a male preserve, whether it's uh, 7 a.m. golf followed by all day cards uh, and uh, nighttime cards as well, all that stuff has changed completely in terms of who gets the bill, who's looking at family spending, who's spending time where doing what. Golf is missing as well as I've tried to indicate a little bit the next generation uh, of uh, kids. They're doing lots of other things besides getting into golf. Uh, there's also a demographic issue, which is um, that a lot of minorities are not recruited into the game, and that's the fastest growing sector of the population. So if you look at the growth of the population, the, where the growth sector is, whether it's Hispanic or African American, for all sorts of reasons, and I'm not attributing any characteristics or um, traits or anything like that, just demographically, statistically, uh, the minority communities, uh, which are growing faster with population based than Caucasians, are not getting into the game. That's a shame. They should. There are too many alternatives uh, for entertainment, whether it's 519 channels on your television or 1,206 versions of ESPN, Deportes, College, SEC, whatever. Um, endless sports arenas and, and sports schedules. Uh, I actually think that one of the things that's really hurt golf, uh, I found this out when I was in the West Coast in Oregon one Saturday when Oregon was playing Oregon State and there was nobody on the golf course. And I realized the college football season is two weeks longer than it used to be. <coughs> used to play 10 games, now they all play 12 and 13. There's another little hit on the weekend golfer as well. And in the South especially, nobody plays golf on Saturday football season for the South. Um, entertainment um, has diverted a lot of attention. Uh, there are a lot of the uh, most profitable section of the uh, food and beverage aspects of the club as well have been all taken over by a pro proliferation of uh, chains, of restaurants, of high quality restaurants, so that the idea of spending Saturday or Friday night dinner at your club now is a forced march dictated by the monthly uh, requirements of food beverage rather than somehow a sort of choice that people really enjoy. There are clubs that provide very good F&B, but for the majority of clubs, it's something that they struggle at and that they lose money at as well. Uh, with the enforcement over the last 15, 20 years of DUI laws, the most profitable sector of any private club has disappeared, which is alcohol. It's an 80, 85% markup. Um, uh, the big issue for private club utilization, I think, is the na changing nature of family commitments. So I spend a lot more time at home now. They go to soccer practice, watching the kids. I can't imagine why. Um, <laughs> um, uh, Alan Iverson was right about practice, by the way. Um, <laughs> the, uh, but there's a lot more of this, what they call nesting. Spending time shopping, home, lawn. Uh, family vacations are a lot shorter as a result. Uh, and there's a lot more time spent uh, with people not getting away as much, but spending time, whether it's with lessons, whether it's family uh, events. Um, the other thing, economically, I think that the ability of, to afford a private club is made much more difficult by the changing nature of the economy. There's a lot less disposable time in terms of work demands, internet and uh, mobility and apps and all that have made actually it more difficult to get away from work rather than easier. Um, so that there's less disposable time, the golf time is a big issue. Uh, there's a lot less disposable income for a entertainment activity, which all golf is, is a opportunity to spend your money doing something 
uh, with a disposable income. There's less of that given the rising costs of everything from college to health care um, to, uh, to uh, utility bills and uh, the difficulties of sustaining long-term careers nowadays in terms of uh, the economy. I think another issue that people really don't want to address because it has a partisan quality, but you look at income distribution in the United States and the stretching out of the uh, middle class incomes, it's much more difficult for middle class families to afford to play golf because incomes are shifting upwards. So you have this bifurcation in the distribution of income. And I think that's really hurt the public golf sector and recruitment into the game because of the uh, difficulty of affordability. Whereas it's given a smaller sector of the economy far more resources. Um, so from an economic and a social and a spending of time and money standpoint, I think golf is uh, kind of an easy, it's easy to understand why the game is suffering, uh, or at least under some stress. Internally, what's interesting is at the same time that facilities are being stretched financially, there are a lot more expectations and understandings about what's possible to set up the golf course. And this is where green committees are really important, because your job is to mediate and to provide some realistic input about what makes sense from a budget standpoint, from a sustainability standpoint, and from a personnel standpoint. And uh, I spent a lot of time listening to superintendents about this. Uh, there are a lot of folks who think that the model of your golf course ought to be a version where you're striping and cross-hatching the fairways and lining up uh, the T uh, stripes with the fairway stripes. Seems to be very important if you're standing on the left side to, on a low cut, down grain to aim at a low cut 212 yards out there. Now this is what people, I think some people expect and that's one of the distressing things that for everyone who was thrilled about the look of Pinehurst last year at the Open where it looked brown and tawny and stressed and uh, kind of scruffy, uh, probably half of American golfers had shown now in various polls thought it would look terrible and they didn't want to have anything to do with it. So if that was supposed to be a constructive experiment for the USG, which it was agronomically, from a marketing and a public relations standpoint, it was kind of a wash. And it's, it's a very difficult thing. We all understand the dynamic of it, but it's one of the difficult things I think you have as green chair persons is to educate your members. Uh, I don't know if Big Dave Otis mentioned this, but I've, one of the things I think is actually helpful as green chairman is to, is to um, how should I put this? Uh, not listen to your members. <laughs> uh, I've learned this. The art of uh, pretending to listen. It's the most important skill for a superintendent they do it all the time. Kind of like being married, actually. Uh, and, uh, I think the more of that can be good. One issue, by the way, with trees, um, I don't think you should ask for permission unless you're after. Uh, so, with a lot of these issues, your job is to show them what's possible rather than to ask them what they want. Because, as Henry Ford said, if you ask people what they wanted, they wanted a faster horse. And uh, he gave them a the car. <laughs> I think we often forget the advances that have been made in the industry. So I love going back to 1977 when the USGA was uh, testing a prototype stint meter and they went around the country and I have all the stats. And uh, we all forget that back in 1977, Augusta National, when it was uh, still Bermuda, was topping out on average of eight foot uh, green speed. What's great, great about this is that when you look at the measurements, and when I used to caddy, I know this, there were tremendous variations from one green to the next. There might, be a, might have been a two, two and a half foot difference from one green to the next. So one of the two things that have happened in the industry, the greens have gotten faster and they've gotten more uniform across. Uh, and people kind of expect this. They forget the only golf course that was faster than nine and a half in the country back then was uh, Oakmont, nine foot eight, Pebble Beach, Paula then and now seven and one. This is an average. Then I went local. Um, and if these superintendents you know, if you had speeds measuring this now, you'd be at Kinko's first day in the resume. <laughs> now, Montana, the average 7'4", Mountain Ridge, where's that, 6'8", uh, Somerset Hills, right down the road, Green Section guys 6'6", six, six, probably just the way they wanted it, and Wingfoot 7'5". So, uh, we forget and we expect things, and we expect kind of uniformity through the year, which is crazy. And uh, you know we expect a certain kind of presentation, which I think is a, really a disaster. And I think one of the things you learn as you look at the facilities and the industry in this country is that every golf course has its own unique, distinct setup and maintenance meld. And there has to be much more variation 
And I think we've almost been a victim of the technical skills of the USGA green section and the, and the agronomic training to, because superintendents can produce something really well, but it doesn't mean it's healthy or viable uh, economically for their facility. So there needs to be a lot more flex in the system, a lot more flex in the calendar as you go. Uh, this is where green chairmen need to work very closely with golf committees and the golf pro and the general manager so that they're on the same page so that there are no surprises about the setup. The regulatory climate has changed completely in terms of what's acceptable. Uh, Mac referred to this a little bit um, in his uh, talk about some of the research being done. But uh, the uh, scrutiny, the monitoring, the expectation about water quality, uh, the, uh, the need for ridge stations, for example, chemical containment, reporting, all that has changed completely. So, a lot of the technical control, and this is actually for the better because it's meant that there's a lot less active ingredients applied to golf courses, a lot more utilization of curatives rather than preventives, and a lot more uh, careful cultural practices and monitoring so that you're more attentive to things like sunlight and air, which are the two healthiest things you can have on a golf course. I think a big incentive for the tree movement in the United States, uh, it's partly a function that they planted a lot of wrong trees over the years, but also because of the regulatory climate and the and the uh, uh, scrutiny of chemical applications, it's much healthier to have a golf course that has sunlight and wind going through it to cultivate healthy turf. It's a really important element. The golf courses are under a lot more stress. Uh, we're seeing the golf courses that are built in floodplains or recent areas for stormwater management. You're seeing a lot more major rain events. Um, and uh, I, to me, anecdotally at least, there's no question that there's a lot more weather extremes. I don't think Global warming is the best phrase I think climate change is because of the extremity of the weathers that we're seeing, where you see facilities that have many more four or five inch rain events interspersed with longer periods of drought, so that the strains on golf courses are a lot greater. Uh, I, I know we don't have quite the uh, uh, water shortages that you find out in Southern California, <coughs> but we still certainly have areas where it's under much greater control. In Connecticut, for example, there's much closer monitoring of public uh, wells. Uh, for golf courses, and the golf course community is very much under pressure because you are essentially a drainage basin for the surrounding community. People think that you know you're poisoning the environment. They look at you. The 90% the, the of people will look at you uh, as a you know a, a toxic waste dump site. In fact, you're a community asset. One of those is when you have storms because the built up areas and the hard surfaces and the development of suburban communities has left the open space of the golf course as one of those few areas where drainage can actually take place. That puts a lot of stress on the golf course as a resource. So the old rules no longer work, and the professionalism required. And one of the things I find that's odd in the industry is the mismatch between the technical skills of your superintendents and what, your, what average golfers think is going on. Um, scientists, superintendents are scientists, they're managers, uh, they're policy managers, highly trained, a lot of technical skills that average golfers don't know about, your job as green chairman is to inform and to educate your members about what those skills are. Uh, and the golf course itself is becoming more and more a preserve, it's a habitat area. Uh, the uh, the uh, nesting that takes place, the refuge that a golf course provides for habitat, and the skills required to be a superintendent I think are really astonishing. Uh, the communication skills that are needed. Uh, being able to reach out and to explain to people what you're doing. You're at a disadvantage as a superintendent. The golf pro has an office right there by the first tee. The superintendent is, is in some kind of dopey barn at the other end of the facility. Feels embarrassed to have to go meet golfers on the first tee. I think superintendents ought to be playing golf a lot more with their members. Uh, they should be invited. They should be made to feel welcome. They should, that's a great way for them to teach and learn and for golfers to learn about what is actually going on. You should encourage that, you should accompany them. Uh, because the, there's a structural disadvantage in terms of the positioning of the superintendent versus the golf pro vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the membership. Uh, a lot of superintendents are pretty savvy about this. They're using social media. Uh, Chris Trinabaugh, who went to, who was at uh, Duluth, um, Northland Country Club, now at Hazeltine, is a master of using a, a Twitter and a, so his own Facebook page as well as communicating. Uh, one of the things that's important, you don't need to communicate with everybody at your club, you only need to communicate with 12 or 15 people at most. And let them spread the word. Uh, the, the sort of no, newsletter stuff and the sheets over the urinals, it only goes so far uh, in terms of reaching out to people. I've seen all these tools. 
The most important thing is having a few people you reach out to who communicate to others. That network, I've seen this all the time. I spent a lot of time walking clubs through master plans. And the politics, and it's not just the politics of master plans, it's tree cutting, tree management, I'm sorry, tree, you never cut a tree, you manage a tree. Uh, uh, all those issues, they need to be communicated kind of informally through a network of golfers who trust and you know, and you're managing and coordinating, and it's a small group, it's not a big group. I think one of the difficult things in communicating, I think a lot of clubs get handicapped by thinking that they need to convince everybody. And I think you're more focused, you're better off using these networks to communicate down. Uh, the golfers are difficult to deal with. I know they're hard to manage. Uh, all sorts of weird behavior that you're dealing with. Uh, so sometimes you need a little bit of signage. Uh, keep them focused. Um, again, they need help. <laughs> Uh, I think it's important to be attentive to the aesthetics of your golf course. If you're going to present yourself as an Ivy League facility like the Hanover Country Club in Dartmouth, you should not look like this. Uh, if necessary, buy the standard parade kit, when, but even better, you can reduce a lot of the clutter. I think uh, sometimes there's a sort of a understanding. We forget sometimes that a golf course is a retreat. It's a refuge. People want to feel good about it. And they're not going to feel good if your facility looks like this. There's an elegance and a beauty and a special quality to the identity and the landscape of a golf course. And I think that sometimes gets lost with all the locker room conversation about pars and bogeys and mowing kinds of cuts. And I'm, I'm a big believer in, in golf course setups being site-specific, site having a specific landscape identity. I think it's easy to forget that. And that's the importance of those views. When you have a lake, you should be looking at it. Your eye wants to scan the horizon line. You're, that's why people play golf. That's why people get away. That's why it still will have a power and an aura in modern culture. Because it's a beautiful space. And if your place looks like this, you're not doing your job. Uh, there are all sorts of signs of dysfunctionality that I see in facilities, whether it's just ridiculous clutter, jamming up you know, uh, too many functions in a small space. Um, I'll have to read this to you, but there are a couple of major signs that I find uh, as a kind of key uh, uh, symptoms of deeper pathology. Um, there's a kind of clubhouse edifice complex where people think that the most yeah, people think that the most important facility is the clubhouse. In fact, 80 percent of the revenue is generated by the golf and the golf course. If it's raining, the parking lot is empty. It doesn't matter how good the hamburgers are. So that's the most important asset. I see uh, certain pathology of clubs that have too many membership categories. I, I, I know a club in Connecticut that had a membership, this was during the real estate, the colonial realty scam, and they had a membership category for guys who were only allowed out of the big house on weekends for golf. <laughs> they, they, true story. Uh, when you have 19 or 20 or 23 different membership categories, it puts a ridiculous strain on the staff. It, it, there's all sorts of a uh, comparison going on, it, to me it's a very difficult management issue. It means you're juggling too many different uh, decisions. Uh, I think the simpler membership category clubs work really much better. I see a lot of facilities that have lived through the last five years, ten years, by borrowing uh, uh, operating expenses from their capital fund and have disinvested as a result. There's a lot of deferred maintenance that's been going on. If they were able to get any fees from initiation, they were using that to pay off uh, operating expenses, and we're seeing that those facilities now are not in a position to improve. The courses and the clubs that do well are able to invest wisely and look at return on investment as if it were a business. And if you were uh, to invest in the golf course, to deal with infrastructure, to address long-term issues that are going to generate a revenue stream. Um, I see a lot of clubs that have cut back on services. Some of those make sense. You don't need five valet parking people on a Tuesday night or to be serving full service dinners on Wednesdays uh, when you're competing against other facilities. You got to be really careful in terms of coming back on essential services to those that define a club. Every club has a level of expectation. Not every club can be an all service, a uh, full service uh, country club to its membership. And I think a lot of clubs got into trouble by thinking that they can add a pool or uh, to, uh, have full service menus or valet parking and think that that would count as a, and they kind of got overstressed in terms of what they could actually provide. I think trying to be all things to all people is a real danger. 
I think a lot of clubs get into trouble when they discount so heavily that they get into this kind of uh, rent a member where you have essentially allowing people in uh, just for the sake of paying monthly or uh, annual dues and they forget about the admissions process and I think there's a lot of deal making and cutting uh, that was done in order to keep membership rolls and to uh, keep cash flow uh, at a facility rather than looking at longer term smarter plans for uh, junior membership recruitment for example um, or creating a deferred payment on uh, initiation fees where people would have an incentive to stay in the club rather than to cut a deal and move elsewhere. I think there's a lot of politics at clubs that we forget about, and I know this is a big issue for the service staff, as, but it's also for managers and board members. And, um, I, you know, I, I think that one of the consequences of our culture these days is I think there's a lot more lack, I think there's a lot less loyalty to clubs. Um, Members don't seem to be as emotionally invested in the traditions and the facilities of a course. I think there's a lot of factionalism by handicap that develops. That's particularly the case when you see the master plans being developed and there's a lot of suspicion by the high handicappers or the senior golfers or the women golfers that it's always being done for one group rather than having an inclusive, uh, comprehensive program and a master plan that really incorporates the diverse needs of the full membership. I have a theory about private clubs and lots of theories, uh, that 30% uh, of the members actually can't afford to be a member. They're the ones who are going to utilize it the most to justify, and they're, they're going to be the source of the most opposition because they're afraid it's going to raise uh, their, uh, their cost and interrupt their utilization of the facility. Uh, I also have a 90-10 rule. This is why I'm always reluctant to ask, uh, you know, to, to go out and ask the members what they want. Not only do most members not know what they want, but most of the noise about what people want is made by 10% of the membership. It's kind of the 90-10 rule. I think this rule this governs in every institution. About 90% of the noise is made by 10% of the membership. So I always hear from clubs, oh, we can't cut down those trees and members will raise the ruckus. Well, first of all, it's your job to do the right thing. And if you anticipate and try to placate, first of all, a lot of these people, you know, the 90-10 rule, the 10%, are kind of like by design miserable wretches anyway. And, so, <laughs> and their job in life, if they're not properly self-liquidating, uh, liquidating in the corner of the bars to make everybody else as miserable as they are. You're never going to be able to placate them. I heard someone said there, gee, you know, we, you look back, they wish they'd cut a few more trees, but you tried to placate. You can't make these people happy. I think actually that a good master plan, tree plan, as well as part of the membership drive, when you drive out that 5% of the membership. <laughs> uh, and so rather than try to placate them, I would try to make them even more unhappy. Uh, <laughs> my political science training tells me that. If you appeal to the majority of the members to do the right thing, to explain, to have town hall meetings, to uh, walk them through the process, the group that's miserable and loud and wretched and noisy is going to retreat into a smaller and smaller, louder and louder corner of the room. And all you can do, you cannot convince them. And I think it's a complete waste of time for a Green Chairman to spend listening to these idiots because uh, your job, they're going to oppose everything you do anyway. And I've seen some of them actually have legal campaigns where they hire lawyers and sue the clubs because the, you know, the, the architect that they hired didn't have a landscape architecture to, uh, license in the state, so they've sued them. And there's all sorts of internal politics that develop. I think the more, really important thing is to decide who's reasonable and who's rational and appeal to them and just forget about the others. You're never going to be able to convince everybody. And I think leadership gets paralyzed when it tries to placate the most vocal and radical elements of a club. Um, I think it's also very difficult at clubs, given the factionalism that develops uh, in any group association, I think employees often find themselves in a difficult position. And this is more for golf pros, managers, and superintendents. I think you have to be really careful not to be caught taking sides. I think your job as a green chairman is to facilitate what's possible to find out what it would take to go and use the resources of the superintendent to find the cost and then to make the case for the board. The superintendent himself should not be making the case for one policy over another. His job is to say, if that's what you want to do, this is what it's going to cost. If that's what you want to do, we're going to have to give up something else. But I think you get in a little bit of a danger at facilities when the superintendent becomes partisan and starts taking sides. Um, Keys to success in the competitive market. 
I've mentioned briefly, and I have a whole other talk I could give on this <coughs> when I think about it, about distinct landscape identity. I think it's very important for you to go back to your courses, look at it, look at it from the standpoint of someone who's coming up for the first time to think, what is distinct and unique about this facility? What's unusual? The rock, the views, uh, the landscape form, the, the history of the club, the history of the design, the restoration character of the golf course. That is what is distinctive and memorable about your golf course. The beauty of golf courses is that there is no standardization of the form. The only rule governing the golf course is that the hole you're playing to is four and a quarter inches across. Everything else varies. Terrain, texture, uh, topography, trees, uh, set, everything else differs. So the more you can enhance, enhance those distinctive features, rather than make it look like every other club, the more marketable, the more branded, the more distinct your facility will be. I think attentive service is really important, uh, and that requires a staff that is loyal, that cares, that uh, takes seriously uh, the folks they're serving and knows them well. Uh, that means that it's important to keep value staff. You can get a lot more value out of people far beyond what you're paying them if they're happy, if they're content, if you pay attention to them, if you cultivate continuity um, rather than sort of micromanage them to death. And I think there are a lot of techniques that you, you can do from a human relations standpoint, whether it's recognizing staff birthdays, uh, time off for, for health crises. Protect the staff as well. It's really important. Uh, if you have a staff, and your staff are being, as an example, if there's sexual harassment at your club by a member, you need to address that. First of all, because the law requires it, and also because it's very good for uh, the relationships among employees to know that you value them, you will protect them. And that, kind of loyalty goes a long way. That's hard to buy. It, it would be nice if you could pay your staff as much as they're worth and to keep them financially uh, as well off as they deserve. But if you're not in that position, and most clubs are not given the economics of industry, you can, you can make up for it by cultivating loyalty and uh, uh, longevity among the staff by respecting them and showing them that you take them seriously as human beings and understand the circumstances that they're working under. That goes a very long way because then it means that there's something to value that the membership has that's special. I think um, in terms of facilities, to get back to the keys to success, I think simple, clear pricing is really important. I think there are way too many public and daily fee and municipal facilities that have a kind of smorgasbord of 42 different prices, and you're sort of sitting there, and it, it, it's very difficult uh, to figure out what you're actually paying, and it's kind of a surcharge for everything. That's more of the public sector. I think for Golf courses, the most important, for years we've suffered from golf courses that were getting longer and longer, 74, 7,500 yards. I have a rule of thumb about golf course yardages, which is that the back tees produce zero revenue. The people who, it's, it's, it's less than 1% of rounds at your course, and they don't pay revenue. They're college kids, they're golf pros, they're industry comps. They're irrelevant from a business standpoint. They might be relevant from marketing, from a kind of, uh, you know, billboard standpoint, from a tournament occasionally. But your golf course has to be playable from 6,200 yards. If it's not playable from 6,200 yards, you're wasting your time. And it's got to be playable from the forward tees at 5,000 yards. Otherwise, you're missing completely uh, who's actually paying the bills at your facility. I think the, con the industry has, has been delusional for 30 years about this back to yard stuff. It's absolutely irrelevant to how a golf course actually functions as a business. Um, I think courses are thriving these days that have good practice areas. I'm seeing a tremendous increase in the attention paid to diversifying driving ranges, developing alternative facilities, short game areas, par three courses, uh, multiple targets, uh, much greater two-ended two use of facilities if you have that. Obviously, a lot of the metropolitan clubs have sold off land and don't have the ability to expand, but if you have a practice facility, given the restraints on time that people have, utilization, and the nature of the game, you have a tremendous competitive advantage against a lot of other people. The practice ranges, uh, the short game areas um, are really important. For public facilities, there's a whole big pace of play issue, um, which I'm not going to get into now. Uh, I do think that one of the valued aspects uh, of a, a golf course is actually having rangers who actually ranger, uh, who can spend time uh, explaining quickly, uh, without going into a whole big thing, about the rules and operation to help you down the road with pace of play. I think pace of play is really important. It can be done in polite, powerful <coughs> ways. Spacing your tee times to 10 and 11 minutes really helps. Uh, 
Uh, if you have eight minute tea times, you're going to have a pace of play problem no matter what, because it's an unrealistic separation. If you go to 10, 11 minute times, you, you're going to end three quarters of the issue. So that, that's for private clubs as well. Um, and having rangers who are actually rangers, having staff who are attentive, as I pointed out. For facilities as well, this might not be as, new, as big an issue in the med area, it is in lots of other areas in the country, uh, allowing walking. Um, junior golf is really important. Uh, you can wait all you want on the first tee, on grow the game initiatives, on uh, uh, play golf in America. Forget about it. Grow the, grow the game in your facility. You have to be training the future members of your facility. It could be caddies, it could be staff, it's junior members, it's kids. If that means turning your facility into a day camp in the summer, so be it. Those are the courses that are doing well. The other one is that the women need to be happy. I know that's uh, something you wouldn't have said 30 years ago at facilities, but it, the whole industry has changed. Guys are easy to make happy. Just give them golf and a hamburger. They don't need a whole lot. Women are much more discriminating about everything from the diet to the safety, uh, the kids in the pool and the facility, and they're much more attentive to detail, and they're going to look at the bottom line uh, because uh, spending priorities and families and income. And I think that the real mark of a well-functioning facility these days is that the women are happy. It's hard to do that at any facility. The golf market is changing dramatically. Uh, I think it helps at facilities to be honest with yourself and with management about what things actually cost and what's achievable. I think we've suffered for too many years with a kind of a, world, a Wall Street perspective on we'll, we'll, we'll pay for it later, but we'll make that work. Instead, it has to be much more benefit-cost analysis. I think communicate with uh, your peers, with uh, superintendents, listening to them, going out and walking with them, spending time in their shoes, having meetings in, in their maintenance facility, for example. I think having, and this is more so for the maintenance staff, seeking honest criticism from respectful colleagues about the true conditions of your golf course uh, is really important. I think having a maintenance staff that's project oriented, you may not be working on a master plan, but it's great to have a crew that is moving toward the next project, a superintendent who's continually upgrading his skill set, who's always got something that they're working on. The last thing you want is one of these uh, super hardworking uh, superintendents who's pulling uh, poses at 5 o'clock on a Sunday and raking bumpers by himself and is always working really hard but is not budgeting his time carefully and thinking about the allocation of his assistance and the skill set required and, uh, and the projects that they're working on to improve the golf course. Um, I think for committees in particular, um, I think you have to spend a lot of time with the people you're managing and spend more time listening them, to them than telling them what to do. I think it really helps to attend the GCSA regional, uh, G GCSA national and regional conferences. It's amazing the equipment, the seminars, uh, the resources that are available. I think at facilities this has been dealt with by Dave Otis. Uh, procedures for complaints and concerns. There has to be a formal procedure for handling. Otherwise, you just open yourself up to everybody just kind of randomly throwing things in your face. I mentioned the uh, all important skill of pretending to listen to members. It's a really cultivated skill. Um, and I think finally, remember, your superintendent is a scientist and you're just a layman. And so you have to show respect and uh, treat them like a professional and a scientist. Those are not easy ways to uh, succeed. There are lots of things here and all over the place in some ways. It's a very competitive market, but I think that uh, those who don't adapt are going to die. I love this photo because this is actually taken. This is the uh, hole in one prize in New Haven Country Club two years ago at the annual meeting of the Connecticut State Funeral Directors. <laughs> True story, we got a two year lease on a hearse. We will ace the 17th hole. So that's your prize. I do think there's light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, I'm engaged in a Grow the Game project myself with our twin grandkids. And uh, I think you should be too. Thanks.